Welcome to the Work Positive Podcast with your host, executive coach and culture architect, Dr. Joey Fawcett. Discover strategies and tactics that work positive as Dr. Joey talks with industry leaders who create a positive work culture that attracts top talent and reduces team turnover. Discover how you can create a work positive culture that increases productivity and profits. Here's your host, Dr. Joey. Work Positive Nation, you know, one of the most intimate topics that we can talk about, whether it's with our significant other, whether it's at work or wherever we're talking, is money. Yep. And uh, there are a whole lot of lies told about money. (laughs) And there are a whole lot of ways to uh, make money. And there are a whole lot of ways to spend your money. One of the, this, because it's the most intimate topic or one of the most intimate topics that we can have conversations about, one of the great challenges for companies who help us invest wisely is creating a company that attracts top talent, reduces team turnover, and creates a positive work culture that actually increases productivity and profits. So how do you do that wrapped around a subject that is as widely talked about, lied about, um, and (laughs) as money. Well, today's guest is going to tell us how to do that. In fact, he didn't just wake up one morning doing this. He's been doing it for a little while now, even though he looks significantly younger than me. He's still been doing it for a little while, and he's done it so well. How well has he done it? He's done it so well that his company has been recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing companies in the U.S. He's located in an amazing city in Texas, San Antonio. In fact, he's got a podcast himself that's all about how you can retire in Texas, which sounds like a good deal to me if I get to be in amazing places like San Antonio, right? Uh, PaxFinancialGroup.com is the website if you want to flip over there and check it out while you're listening to this great podcast. My friend, Work Positive Nation, your new friend, Daryl Lyons. Daryl, welcome to the Work Positive podcast, my friend. Thank you. That was a very kind introduction, so I appreciate it. Yeah, well, we have known each other a while, but I just want to make sure that they understand you were, what, 15 when we met? Something like that? Yeah. 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 (laughs) I was just getting my driver's license permit, yeah. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, I did not drive the school bus for Daryl. Just saying, okay? I just want to clarify that. Daryl, man, money is one of those topics. I mean, if we're talking about it, odds are we're lying about it, right? But, uh, man, money is just one of those personal topics. So when somebody asks you, you know, What's your personal financial statement look like? You you run for the hills, right? How do you build a company, Daryl, as successfully as you have with Pax Financial Group that is such a good fiduciary, such a good steward of people's money and build it around core values like you have? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, The core values are a key piece. When we first started, we didn't have an employee handbook. Um, You know, we couldn't afford one. So, it was me and uh, two other guys. So there's three of us. And um, we just lo- we just basically opened all the books that we liked um, from Jim Collins to Dan Miller to Dave Ramsey. And we uh, extrapolated the quotes and the uh, commentary that was really impactful to our lives. And we created a, a worksheet that was called the PAX Principles. Mm-hmm. And the PAX Principles of what we lived by for many, many years and then we started to understand values and how you actually can, can make that more concise. And so we started to create some values working with a, somebody like yourself. And we continue to emphasize that. Sometimes I call myself the chief uh, reminding officer because I have to constantly <laughs> remind people values. We actually hire and fire off of those values. Mm. We do performance reviews off those values. Mm. So we, we actually have um, some tools that help us reinforce those values. So hmm. I tend to, it's because of my personality type, I tend to live in a place where I want to be authentic. And so if I'm going to have values, I don't want them just to be sitting there on a website. I want to actually integrate them. Otherwise, why even have them? I mean, I, hmm. I, I was talking with a company, a very, very big company, and I remember asking the, the CFO, yeah, I think she was the CFO. I asked her, if, uh, what are the values? And I wasn't asking to catch her off guard. I was just asking because I, I wanted to know. 
Yeah. And she really didn't know it. And and I think then she started to go kind of like, okay, it's integrity, exceptionalism, kind of the ones that it's the table stakes. <laughs> and, you know, it just, it just, I just dawned on me. I just don't want that. I don't want my key leadership to have a hard time with the values because otherwise it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it does, it's meaningless. So I say all that, I guess the long answer to the short question is, is that we, idea. you know, we've just, it's been important to us. It's been really important for our identity is to have those values. And they started out as principles and then they've evolved to that. Right. So your values aren't just written in an employee handbook. I assume you have one now. Now, um, yeah, now we have one. Yeah. Yeah. You've got an employee handbook, but the values are just written in there and stuck on a shelf and you never talk about them. So how do you, uh, CRO, I love that chief reminder officer, yeah. how do you remind the PAX financial group team members about these values and make sure they're integrated? Yeah. And so you may be wondering, what are those values? Um, and so we've, we've refined them down to three um, mm. now, and that's constant improvement, respect, and stewardship. Mm. We, and we had five and then we just, um, wanted to really get a little bit more hyper focused. All right. And um, I read stuff on these values, and I'm not sure if there's a right or wrong. I know that people have opinions, but <laughs> I just narrowed them down to those three. So we constantly talk about it. We use a tool that's very helpful. You know, technology does a lot of the heavy lifting now. We use a tool called Tiny Pulse. Okay. And Tiny Pulse is a is a I guess kind of a workplace focused platform that allows us to communicate and keep notes. So I do a lot of my coaching to the advisors. I keep my notes on there. But the other thing that you can do, it's called send cheers for peers. Mm. And so you can send cheers to different employees randomly if you've seen them do something exceptional. Uh -huh. But the key element to that is attaching that ex that behavior to a value. So if I were to say something like, hey, great job passing your test, Haley, and I clicked on that, then I would I would link it to constant improvement. And then we can actually take inventory of at the end of the year of who got the most cheers um, <laughs> and who gave the most cheers. Now, the, the thing about that I do as one of my key, um, I guess, my key performance indicators, I've got five. One of them is tiny pulse engagement. So I actually measure and monitor and encourage and if I have high, tiny pulse engagement, I think we've got a healthy culture. And so I look for the number to be about 70%. If it falls below that, then I just feel like there's some disengagement. But if it stays above that, I feel like we're, we're healthy. Mm. And that's, that just means people are passing along cheers and they're communicating with each other. So that's been very helpful for me to reinforce that as the chief reminding officer, having a tool to support me. Oh, wow. And to track the level of engagement and to do so in productive ways. And I, I love yeah. the way it, it allows you to connect back with your core values. And by the way, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. no apologies needed for only three core values, right? Because mm -hmm. so often there's like 16 or 12 or, you know, nine or something. And it's like you start listing them and you go, well, I think integrity is one of them. Uh, it might yeah. be, you know, it, but I love the hyper focus on three, which really allows you to, to flesh that out. So how do you communicate this as a part of your attraction of top talent, Daryl? Yeah, it's a good question. So one of the things that I think is key for us to attract top talent is for me not to be in the interview anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, you're not talking about podcasts like this. You mean the, the, like interviewing the literal. <laughs> yeah, talented people, because I have this thing in me that sees the best in everyone. Mm. And it's it's helped me get where I'm at today. But there's nobody I've met that I don't look at and see just God's like unique creation and uh -huh. the opportunity and the talent. And um, they could be witty, they could be kind, whatever it is, I just anchor to that. And mm. then I do see their flaws, but I go, you know what? Once they get here, we'll fix it. <laughs> they haven't worked for me yet. It'll be okay. <laughs> and it's, it's killed me. I mean, I have hired some really stupid people and... <laughs> Like, but they were witty, Daryl. <laughs> they were witty. They were nice. Like my daughter, she's 15 and, and I'm afraid she's going to get a boyfriend. And the first thing she's going to say is, yeah, he's nice. I'm like, no. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> no, I, so that, but, but I do it too. And uh-huh. so anyways, I say all that because my team does most of the interviewing now. And then I come in and kind of, of course, provide some guidance and, and feedback, but I tend to stay away from the interviewing process a bit. Hasn't worked out real well for me, but I would say that I've refined that a little bit. Now I'm a little bit more self-aware. So if I do get engaged, I, I catch myself, you know, we have the faith-based element to our organization. Okay. So part of the screening happens when we share with people the faith component that mm-hmm. is a part of our culture. Right. And um, we don't want to violate any EEOC or discrimination laws. So oftentimes we just tell people in our culture, we pray. Um, mm-hmm. We may You may hear scripture. Um, and so you're welcome to come here and not share those beliefs but you may feel uncomfortable. And so we just want to let you know from the get go. And so that's often that language. We're very delicate about it because we don't want to get in trouble or or do the wrong thing either. Mm. Uh, But that oftentimes screens people. So I suppose that if anyone's listening, they don't have a faith base, they could talk about the uniqueness of the culture in such a way that it might actually turn off people. And if you don't, Mm. you know, in a lot of ways, if you don't have a culture that turns off people, it reminds me of that old saying, if everyone likes you, you're lying to someone. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I guess for me, if I were to talk to a business owner and say, if you don't have a culture that maybe repels people, then you probably want to kind of think about who you are a little bit more. Yeah. And give some clear definition to that, because it's all about attracting top talent, which means there's some consistency in shared values. There's certainly a recognition of priorities, what's important about life to you, and then uh, openness to their unique contribution that they can make to the team. And and here's what we're looking for wrapped around that. So knowing who you are as a company has to be a key to attracting top talent. So let's say uh, you're not primarily involved in the interviewing process. So you're not, Pax Financial Group is not hiring stupid people, right? Yours, not mine. So they're there, they're smart people, the culture aligns quite well, but still there's that human dynamic, right? How do you reduce team turnover and keep this top talent at Pax Financial Group, Daryl? Yeah, first, I mean, I got to tell you, the the people that are at the organization that do a lot of the heavy lifting, I have to give them a ton of credit for what they put in place to help keep the top talent. But one of the, the onboarding pieces is uh, performance reviews um, really frequently in the early stages. Sure. There's a phrase we use in our organization, to be unclear is to be unkind. Mm. And so we give feedback early in the relationship and set the standard of what you know, if there's a somewhat of a deviation from expectations, it's acknowledged really early. Mm-hmm. And the feedback is a peer review feedback. So it's not just supervisor. There's other peers in the room that okay. pour into the people that are new. And so that's that's helpful. Then as ongoing, I think, you know, I often think about, you know, it's kind of a, it's talked about more and more and more. And I can see why, but creating a psychologically safe culture Mm. where people don't feel like they're threatened psychologically. And it sounds kind of nuanced, but, Mm. you know, if people are always wondering if somebody's going to talk behind their back or say something about them or, or, you know, the boss is going to, you know, say something like go off, like just have a bad day, Mm. you know, everyone on pins and needles, you know, the research that I've read, that type of culture is really what people are running away from. And Mm. they're going to the organizations that are psychologically safe, even if it's, even if it's at the cost of, of income. And so I think we've created a psychologically safe culture and we want to continue to try to try to keep that going. Um, and, and I think a lot of it is just rooted in humility across the board. Hmm. Yeah, SHRM surveys indicate between 54 and 58 percent of people who leave a job leave because of a bad boss and, and mm-hmm. going off and right like that. So psychologically safe, what are some of the, or some of the ways that you create that psychologically safe environment? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's several ways and I think Mm -hmm. I often learn from, um, here in San Antonio, there's a pretty good basketball team, San Antonio Spurs. I've heard of them before. Didn't, uh, Tim Duncan play for them? 
Tim Duncan, David Robinson. Oh, David Robinson. That's right. Naval guy. Yeah. Uh -huh. Naval guy. Exactly. Yeah, I think I have heard of your team, that, that team before. Yeah. They're, they're not bad. They, they you might know, have it, won a championship somewhere along the way. Well, one of the things that they've done, um, and I've had some good close engagements with some of the, you know, their, their personnel and athletes over the years being local in San Antonio. Right. One of the things they've done that I think is worthy of recognizing for any leader, and I actually heard this from a friend who just had lunch with R.C. Buford. So R.C. Buford's the general manager and, re and really responsible for bringing in and retaining the talent, just brilliant in a mm. lot of ways. Greg Popovich, Popovich is part of that, but R.C. Buford was a key part too. And one mm. of the things that one of my friends who had lunch with him just, just last week he asked RC, he goes, what's one of the, the reasons that you've been so successful? And um, RC mentioned several things, three things, but I only remember one. Uh -huh. And that, that was he always brought in people who thought about life and basketball beyond just themselves. It was bigger mm -hmm. than themselves. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that leads me to answer your question is that I oftentimes – feel responsible for making sure that my team and everyone here thinks about their role as much bigger part than just their role. And so we, we celebrate, we measure, we monitor, we do a lot of stuff to support that idea, but it has to be beyond ourselves because we just, we live in the richest nation in the history of the world. And we've just, we're just really, you know, really self-absorbed in a lot of ways and disconnected from how good we have it. Yeah. So, so some of the things that we do, just as an example, is we, you know, we give days for people to do volunteer work and we mm. facilitate that. Gosh, there's so much that we do. I don't want to go off on a, on a tangent, but there's a lot we do and I'd be happy to, but there's a lot we do to make sure that people are reminded how good they have it as a person. And I think that plays a key role in appreciating what they have. And so mm -hmm. that's, I think that's important is just the constant reframing. Um, so we don't get kind of self-absorbed and pout about things that are petty. Yeah. And that, man, I can really see how giving to others creates a psychologically safe environment because it, that diminishes uh, narcissism right off the bat, right? Yeah. When you're concerned with others and nar narcissism is that quick path, right, to uh, abuse in the workplace. So psychologically safe really depends on me regarding you as highly as myself. Uh, it's not that I think less of myself. It's that I think less about myself. Uh, the exactly. famous C.S. Lewis quote. So I love that, man. A way of creating a psychologically safe environment is to... Give team members time off to go do volunteer work. That's pretty cool. So do your teams. I'm, I'm just really curious here, Daryl. Daryl Lyons is my guest here on this episode of Work Positive Podcast. Uh, if you want to flip over to PaxFinancialGroup.com right now, take a look at the amazing work that they do. They are one of Inc. Magazine's 5,000 fastest growing companies in the U.S., so they're doing something right. Um, do your teams, Daryl, band together? In other words, do does a team get together and say, hey, we're going to this place to volunteer on this day, or uh, maybe working across teams to gather groups of people from PACs that go do this volunteer work, or is it just one-offs, whatever I want to do? It's a good question. I, it happens better in a team because it's okay. easy to cancel, mm -hmm. right? Like it's easy. I'll schedule it. I've done it. I'll schedule a nonprofit work day. And then when it gets closer, I'm like, oh, I got so much to do. So I've, I've yeah. done it several times. I can't make it. But when you've got a team, then, then it's a little stickier. Mm. One of the key things that all organizations have to battle and it's, and you can't take your eye off the ball is the, sometimes the, either it's stated or it's implied or it's just under the surface uh, friction that exists between operations and sales. <laughs> it's endemic to the species, isn't it? I don't care what industry you're in. It's every single one. Yep. And so as a leader, it's incumbent upon me to get in front of that mm. and knowing that it's going to exist, but try to, when challenges and miscommunications do happen, it, it's done in a framework of trust that mm. people are not, people are actually coming together not to belittle or undermine anybody, but to solve problems. So I say all that because it's important that the, these two groups and some formation of them do this work together mm. because in that work together is where they build that relationship. And then when they do have those 
miscommunications, um, it's done in a, in a spirit that's, that's safe. So that's, that's key to get them to go together. Yeah. And so if I've, uh, if I'm in sales and I've stood shoulder to shoulder with somebody from ops, right. Serving in the soup kitchen or sorted clothes, clothes pantry or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm much more likely to, uh, to come back to work. Uh, mm -hmm. without that diametrical relationship or without the polarities, right? We work together here. We can work together there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned one challenge, and that is uh, siloing <laughs> in that case around ops and sales. What are some other challenges that you faced along the way to helping PAX Financial Group become a positive work culture company? Yeah, I think, you know, if you're a small business owner, you always have cash flow issues. And it's not, we've been pretty good with cash flow by the grace of God. Um, part of it is, I mean, this is not to my credit, but I, I think about cash flow. I don't let it just, I look at it, I, you know, I spreadsheet stuff. That's just part of the way God wired me. So that helps. But for a business owner who takes their eye off the cash flow, that's pick up and all of a sudden revenues decline. And, and you know, a lot of times business owners, we, we sell our way out of problems, mm. right? So, but every year, you know, going through those budget things, but to answer your question a little bit more directly, mm. cash flow is a challenge in the fact that you try to work in with, within, you know, your constraints. And I'm always struggling with the balance between three things. And it's almost like a three-legged stool and that's say lead flow. Like, where do we get the leads from? Mm -hmm. And we've had some national um, relation, strategic relationships that give us good leads. So we're blessed that way. That's So I have to get lead flow up. But then when I get lead flow up, I don't have as many advisors to support them. All right. Then I have to get advisors. And then now the advisors are coming to me and saying, I'm, you know, burning the candles at both ends. And, and that's not healthy. So I need support staff, right? Mm. And so me balancing where and how I invest in these three areas mm. and getting in front of that a little bit, knowing that one's going to be stressed for a, a period of time, mm. that's my biggest challenge. And, and I and I assume that's with most businesses is just, you know, okay, I'm so for example, right now our leads are great and our advisor team is is doing good, but I can tell my support is starting to to break a little bit. Not and not break, but I just want to get in front of that. So I've got to start hiring for that. Mm. So just those types of challenges are tricky. And, and in the meantime, I just spend a lot of time communicating with the advisors or wherever something's broken in a, in a, in a spirit of transparency. Mm. So we, we struggled with for years, how much we want to be transparent about our organization. So we share the, we share what our revenue is. Mm. We don't share net income, but you could do the math and yeah, <laughs> Just we prefer to share revenue. So I'll often tell them, you know, my revenue is down right now. But just so you know, I, you know, my hope is that we can hire somebody to support you. But just in the meantime, let's just figure out how to work mm. through this. And so I think that's one of the bigger challenges that we face. And, and I don't think that'll ever end. Mm. Yeah. So you're really balancing the three legs of that stool, recognizing that you can go from feast to famine and from famine to feast really fast. Yeah. Uh, and so keeping that balanced definitely affects for a positive work culture. And you use such an important word there, transparency, mm -hmm. how much to share. You know, you don't want to overshare, but at the same time, you want to create an investor mentality among the teams. Right. And they also want to know you're paying attention to that three legged stool and that you see what they're experiencing. And that is uh, support staffs cracking in, in your example. So I love that. How do you achieve the security necessary? And here, maybe I'm talking about emotional, psychological, mental security necessary as a leader, as a founder of a company to be that transparent with team members. I, I want to make sure I understand the question. How do you, how do you be what? How do you? Yeah. How do you develop that emotional security or oh. it can be mental security, oh, uh, psychological see. security to be that transparent with your team members? Yeah, I think I, I reconciled that a while back. I did have a few successful business owners that I I went to mm. and I asked them what they did and it wasn't a consensus. So mm. I had to extrapolate what I thought was was the right thing to do. But where I why I landed on being transparent on the revenue is because 
I found that people will create stories in their head if they don't have <laughs> some information and they're usually not the best case stories. Oh, that's right. So my effort to create a psychologically safe environment, I felt the least I could do was share revenue. And um, I haven't looked back. I think it's been very helpful for our organization as a whole. Mm, yeah. Yeah. We abhor a vacuum. Right. And we make up stories, as you said, if there's a vacuum of information based on just a smidgen of observation. And we tend to go negative with that. Right. So it's our imagination falls into the down the hole with Alice. Right. And, and it oh, just gets goodness, worse yes. and worse and worse. So, man, I admire that. And that's got to create a positive work culture because they know, hey, we can listen to Daryl. We can trust what he says. And he's he's given us enough information and accurate information to know what's going on here. Daryl Lyons is the founder of Pax Financial Group. And you can go to paxfinancialgroup.com right now. Also the author of Small Business, Big Pressure, an excellent book that uh, I still open pages to and uh, learn from each time I'm, I'm facing a situation. I just kind of go to that book and read about it. A, it's nice to know that uh, the big pressures were with you too, my friend, <laughs> and with people that you know, and then uh, B, that you can actually survive them and find your way through them. Work Positive Nation always wants to know from my guest, Daryl, about one action they can take, one thing they can do starting today to create that positive work culture that increases productivity and profits. What's your bit of wisdom that you would share with Work Positive Nation about your one thing? There's so much. Yeah. But I really want to tell you about a real little system that we set up a long time ago that has been helpful. And that's the six most system where everyone before they leave and go home, they need to write down the six most important things that they do for the next day. Mm. And it to a certain six is a magical number. I don't know where I got it from, but I got it from somewhere. <laughs> and, but it allows them to decompress, mm. put that on paper. If they ever come to me and they say they're overwhelmed, mm. they've got so much going on. I always ask them, the first thing I ask, and they know it by now, is are you doing your six most? Because I would be overwhelmed with mm. everything coming at me. Sure. But the six most gives a simple, uh, gives a person a simple system to when they go come in, the first thing they do in the morning after their coffee or whatever, they don't think about their day, the overwhelmingness, their overwhelming tasks, everything's thrown at them, the whirlwind. They go to their six most and they do one at a time. There's a dopamine hit to each of those. Sure. And that's something that I've adopted a long time ago, and it's really helped my team from getting overwhelmed. And so that's what I'd encourage those that have a team to consider adopting. Man, I love that. It also must have an added benefit of allowing that team member to decompress from the day and leave work at work yeah. and then turn to the people that you love and have fun with, right? Uh, exactly. your family and others. So then you can leave work at work and not uh, deliver the mail to the wrong address, as I like to say. So the work frustrations don't come home and and assault the family. By the way, uh, we were speaking before we started the interview about Dr. Ivan Meisner, uh, yeah. founder of BNI. One of Ivan's favorite phrases is, in fact, if you listen to his episode here on the Work Positive Podcast, he talks about doing six things a thousand times as opposed to a thousand things six times. So it, it's very consistent with your uh, six most. So maybe there is something magical about that number six. Maybe we need to it's peculiar to me because as a Christian, I anchored the number seven, not six, but I just let that stuff go. That's just <laughs> Well, here's a shout out to all the people who love the number six also. <laughs> right? Daryl no Lyons, Fax Finan Fax Financial Group .com. Uh, My favorite book of his is Small Business Big pressure but uh he wants you to go by 18 to 80 right <laughs> which is a personal financial book uh covering the lifespan and also he wants you to go by uh what's the grand book the grand, the grand money, money chasm, chasm. Yeah. yeah right yeah. 
it's for guys like me who are new grandparents and how you can uh, help. Mine's the most beautiful, brilliant little girl ever born. How you can help your grandchildren uh, achieve a fun, how you can perpetuate your financial legacy in ways that assist your grandchildren without debilitating them, right? That's right. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Daryl, thanks so much, man. I, I learned so much from you every time I'm with you. I love you like a brother, and I just really appreciate the gift of you today. Thank you so much. That's an honor. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Work Positive Podcast with your host, executive coach and culture architect, Dr. Joey Fawcett. Please share this podcast with your friends who are small business leaders so they can create a positive work culture that increases their productivity and profits. Get your free 15-point work positive checklist to help you attract top talent and reduce team turnover. Download this checklist at workpositive.today slash checklist. Remember, it pays to work positive.